You want to come on? Come here, Chico. Come here. Get up in my lap. Come on. Good boy. Okay. Good boy. Okay. Hello. This is Chico. This is one of the bodhisattvas I live with. I spent 45 years studying Zen Buddhism. And every course of spiritual study has a kind of narrative behind it. And over the years, I've looked for ways to loosen the Japanese gift wrapping and get at the actual gift of meditating Buddhism underneath. Because I think it's easier for Americans to get to that core truth if it's expressed in vernacular. Also, although I studied in a pretty traditional Japanese way, 45 years later there are some aspects of Japanese practice that can be a little troublesome and have gotten some Zen centers in trouble. And those are cultural attributes of authoritarianism and hierarchy which merge a little too easily with American preoccupations with power and status. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about what it's like to see the world from Buddha's point of view. There are two different ways of looking at the world. They're diametrically opposed to one another. They're contradictory. And yet they're both true. And we need both, but we rarely use both. So the first is the ordinary way that our five senses bring us the world isolated objects, what the Chinese call the 10,000 things. Everything has a name, and the implication is that because it's named, it's a separate, discrete, standalone thing. That world is ruled by intelligence. Intelligence is responsible for our wealth, our status, our relaxation, our toys, our long lives, our superfluity of food. We love it so much we name a lot of our favorite objects smartphones, smart cars. But sometimes we forget that intelligence has a shadow. And the shadow is that it has no moral valence. Intelligence can build a hospital or a concentration camp. It can discover penicillin or nerve gas or a biotoxin. And so that it has a shadow. And we ignore that shadow at our peril. So the other way of looking at the world is seeing everything as interconnected. 
if we think about it for a few minutes, you've never been free of sunshine. You've never been free of oxygen. You've never been free of water, neither have I. Never been free of the microbes in the soil that grow your food. Never been free of pollinating insects or the birds that control pests. Take it all the way out to the Earth's place in the solar system. If we were closer to the sun, water would burn off. We wouldn't be here. If we were farther away, it would freeze. So it's not an exaggeration, it's not a spiritual metaphor to say that we're all interdependent, we're all attached. Twenty-five hundred years ago, Buddha identified the common denominator energy, the kind of roiling pregnant energy that expresses itself in infinite forms. It becomes your life, my life, solar systems, shooting stars, hummingbirds, dolphins, jaguars, mountain ranges. And he called that emptiness. And the reason he called it emptiness was because it was empty of self. So going back to the first way of looking at things, which I call the relative, because in a world of single objects, things are discriminated by being related to others. A fat person is fatter than a thin one. A long trip is related to a short trip. You get it. So when we look for this self, we all have a feeling of the self. We all have self-awareness. But there's no physical organ or part of the body that is related to that self. We don't have a little walnut with our name on it tucked under our liver. If I show you my hand, and then I say, well, if I take off the skin, the blood vessels, the nerves, the ligaments, the muscles, the tendons, the bones, there's no hand in there. The hand is a composite of all those things. And one of the shadow sides of language is the illusion that it creates of separate independent existences and the way that the laws of grammar and syntax kind of imprison us. The holistic view has a shadow too. That world is too big to be ruled by intelligence. There's too much data. You can't reason your way through it. So that world is ruled by intuition. And intuition is a much older uh, procedure than intelligence. In fact, it's made up of intelligence and memory and emotion. And it fires massive areas of the brain simultaneously toward decision-making. Uh, toward decision-making. The first monkey that was eating a nut when he heard a rustling in the woods and he jumped up in the tree thinking it was a lion and another monkey came and stole the nut, added a little digit to his memory. Perhaps the next time he waited for another piece of confirmation before he jumped up in the tree. Maybe he got eaten. So when we make a decision based on only one description of the world, we're victimized by the shadow. We can do things in the relative world that seem smart, that seem logical, that seem sound, but they're based on descriptions of the world and they're based on the rules of syntax and uh, logic.
if we decide we're the good guys <laughs> instead of just human beings, <laughs> we exempt ourselves of the consequences of dropping bombs on a major city at night because we don't like the leader of those people. We exempt ourselves from responsibility. But in fact, if there's no self, if there's no fixed self, then that idea of who we are is based on habits, what we've been told about ourselves, what we've implied about ourselves, like little snapshots. I imagine the captain's cabin of a ship, the wheelhouse, and the captain's in there directing our seeing and hearing and we think. And the walls are lined with little photographs of ourselves at different ages, birthday parties, relatives, little post-it notes of who we are. And we forget that they all represent just an instant. A photograph's 125th of a second. The mother who was angry at us, 10 minutes later was another mother, was a different person. And so can we be. And the device and the exercise that invites us to reinvestigate these habits and conclusions is meditation. Letting the mind slow down by focusing on the breath or the posture or the posture and the breath. And as the mind slows down, you get to re-examine these ideas of this self, which you can't find, which has no color, which has no shape, which has no location, and yet we take it deadly seriously. Someone insults us and we're ready to fight. It's like insulting the air that's escaping from a balloon. So if we realize that there's no self, then we're human beings. We're like human radios, and we're available to the entire spectrum of human thought and feeling. And if I know that I can be anyone from the Dalai Lama to Pol Pot or Hitler, then the responsibility is mine to keep watch and make sure that when negative or hateful or envious or competitive emotions come up, I keep my little corner of the world clean and I don't let them out. But for most people, we just want to think of ourselves as good. And we don't want to go through the work and the effort. And consequently, the good guys killed three million people in Vietnam. The good guys bombed women and children in their beds because someone told us to. If we're not aware of our own shadows, we put them on other people. If I know that I can be angry and snarky and jealous and irritable, I can own that and I can take care of it. Or I can go on daily costs or some kind of blog, and every time someone says something I don't agree with, I can attack them and try to eradicate them as if the evil was out there, as if the ignorance was out there, and not right here. And we create the problems we're trying to solve over and over and over again. And now we're kind of reaching critical mass. It's a really hard time. <laughs>